in the past when people have been talking about uh, capitalism and crises of capitalism they've tended to see it entirely in terms of economic relations things like the rate of profit um, under consumption and things like that but if you are a historical materialist you have to understand the crises of modes of production as involving something more than that. A mode of production isn't just economic relations as they are understood in capitalist terms, in terms of money and, and value. A mode of production, as the term implies, is a way of making things. It's a metabolism with nature. And the transitions between modes of production are associated with changes in the metabolism between human beings and nature. And the big shifts from hunter-gatherer society to agricultural society, different forms of agricultural society like hunter, hunter uh, sorry, herding versus field agriculture, and the transition from agricultural economies to industrial economies have involved different relationships with nature and different sources of energy. And if you're going to consider the real breadth of the crisis of capitalist civilization, you can't do it just at the monetary level. You have to consider the relationship with nature and how the whole world system is altered by capitalism. It's at least arguable that this isn't the first time it's happened, that growing population in the Mesolithic and the extinction of large game animals was a forcing factor in moving human society towards agriculture. And you can say again that, for example, the elimination of the sources of fuel in the form of charcoal in the 17th and 18th century in Europe was a forcing factor in moving towards the fossil fuel economy based on coal. So let's look at this system. I present it in terms of feedback diagrams. And this is my grasp of the way the system works at the moment. As you can see, it involves lots of little boxes, like the level of oil price, the rate of fuel use, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere, the rate of food production, etc. These all interact with one another with positive or negative feedback relationships. A positive feedback relationship is shown by a plus here. So, for example, the level of scientific knowledge is positively related to the level of nuclear and wind energy use. The uh, level of world tension is negatively related to the rate of signing international treaties and the rate of interna signing international treaties on climate control is positively related to the use of wind and nuclear power, etc. So, this is a large and complicated diagram. Uh, I'm going to upload the background slides for this and we'll present a link to it on the YouTube page of the, the, the video. Now, the human system is coupled to the energy atmosphere system. The energy atmosphere system is the most basic driving system of the, the world as a whole. And it's very complicated, but this is something which we're now in a position to be able to scientifically model and models of it 
have been constructed and many of them have been constructed and are used to predict what the effect is li likely to be of changing atmospheric composition and how this rela relates to human interaction with it. If we zoom in here, the most important thing affecting human beings as the climate changes is not rising sea levels but the bad effect that higher temperatures are going to have on food production. These are optimistic and pessimistic projections of the effect of changing climate on world food production. Now the, the key to it is that if something is in green it means there's an improvement. If it's yellow to brown it means things are getting worse. This is the 2020s, 2050s, 2080s. Now let's just look at the most optimistic assumption. By the 2020s even on optimistic assumptions we're already showing a few percent up to five to five percent decline in food production across China, India, Africa and much of Latin America and an even worse decline in Siberia. Why that is the case I'm not sure. As we go through you start to get improvements in food production in northern temperate zones like northern Europe, Canada, Argentina. Whereas the decline in food production becomes worse across the tropical zones. This is and by the end of the period by about 65 years from now it has declined disastrously in Africa for example. However this is on the most optimistic projection. If we take the pessimistic projection the only area which shows any improvement in food production is Canada and over most of the world food production declines. It's o the only areas in this scheme which have any kind of um, manageable decline in food production are the northern and western Europe. And you have to think what the implications for that are in that most of the world's population lives in the areas that are going to be drastically affected. This has huge implications for human survival and for the change in the geopolitics of the world. Now, Parry and Nelson think that this is going to be acceptable, that the optimistic scenario will play out. In, in the optimistic scenario, they show food security actually improves. And they're, they're basing it on the assumption that uh, productivity will rise to offset the declining uh, environmental circumstances. But if you take the pessimistic assumptions about economic growth and uh, growth and productivity, the growth and productivity isn't sufficient to offset a big decline across the developed countries, developing countries and low-income developing countries. And this is a, a decline which they're showing starting at the time they're writing, 2010. Daring and others ha have a more pessimistic view than the previous study. They're showing that if, if we take the main crops like maize, soybeans, spring wheat 
and we take the different scenarios run on different climate models. By 2050, all of these are showing drastic declines. Declines in maize, for example, of up to 34 percent by by 2050. Um, so these are very serious declines in food production. And declines in food production and the famines associated with them have historically been associated with the collapse of civilizations. On top of this, the situation is made much worse by current pressures to use biofuel. If you start using biofuel, you're competing between food and fuel. So biofuels help push up world food prices. And this has a big effect. It's arguable that the instability of the Arab Spring in, in 2010 was caused by a peak in world food prices produced by the increase in biofuels, which was eating up grain reserves. I wrote this talk for a conference in 2012. At that point, 18% of biofuels in the UK were made from wheat and corn, which are staple foods in the developing world. And that was a sudden increase, sudden requirement due to EU legislation that biodiesel had to be used. The EU was planning to double the amount of biofuels it used. Spending fuel in cars which could be feeding people is almost criminal as far as I can see. It, it, it is a terrible policy. Now, the effect of this is that you get an interaction between energy production, technologies of energy production, and the world political system. If we zoom in on this area, I was saying that the level of world tension affects the, the rate of signing treaties. And if there's a lower rate of signing treaties, you get Oh, ah, you get reduced climate amelioration. As the level of world oil stocks goes down, the level of world tension rises. Uh, if the world oil stocks are high, the oil price tends to be low. Negative relationship here. If oil prices are low, more fuel is used. If more fuel is used, the oil stocks are reduced. But more generally, there, there is this set of feedback relations which come through into politics. Now, why is it such a political issue? Well, it, re it relates to the nature of oil price and ground rent. The oil rent states have a clear interest in preventing the introduction of CO2 quotas, as this is going to cut their rent revenue. And ideally, this rent revenue would be transferred to some body like the UN, which was issuing the quotas. And this body could then auction them. But if that were the case, there's clearly a huge transfer of revenue from the oil producing states in the Middle East, Russia, Venezuela, etc., and the UN. If we zoom in on this, here is quantity of oil being produced. This is the marginal cost of oil. And the difference between the marginal cost and the average cost comes as rent to the oil producing states. Now, if there is no quota restriction on oil production, Oil production will increase 
and the price will rise at the marginal fields as the less and less um, efficient oil sources start to be used primarily offshore ones arctic ones etc which are expensive to produce under these circumstances the existing states which have substantial oil reserves can hope to earn a big rent due to the difference between the marginal uh, production price and the average production price. If the UN was to start introducing quotas which reduce the amount of available oil which can be produced, the price is going to sell for lower or the marginal selling price will be lower or the marginal production prices will be lower and the equivalent rent in this area here would be being appropriated by the UN when it um, sold the quotas off. So any proposal to reduce overall oil production is going to be very heavily resisted by all the oil producing states and that of course in includes the oil producing interests within the United States and they have no interest in the transfer of, of revenue to the UN which would occur. Now the fact that oil becomes an increasingly scarce commodity means that control over oil choke points in transit becomes increasingly important in great co power competition and we can already see this develop developing. This shows the main sources of oil and the main uh, choke points. Most of the oil is coming out of the Middle East. Some is coming overland from Russia and some is emerging from South American and West African sources. But this means that through certain choke points there are millions of barrels of oil a day being shipped. The Straits of Hormuz, the area around Yemen, Suez, the Malacca Straits. Now historically control over these choke points has been a central objective of naval strategy. If you go back to the period of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century Britain as the leading naval power maintained bases to control the Malacca Straits at Singapore, the um, Aden to control entry into the Red Sea, uh, they controlled Suez, they controlled Panama which is another potential, ch sorry, they controlled Gibraltar another potential choke point and they controlled the choke point going round Africa and round South America with bases in the Falkland Islands and in South at the Cape of Good Hope. Now British world naval dominance has gone but the US and other powers are following a similar policy now. It is the policy of the Indian Navy to be in a position to cut off the supply of oil to China by dominating the Malacca Straits. China in return is attempting to establish naval bases in Djibouti, Ceylon and provide its own route to the Middle East. The US obviously still controls access via Panama but control over these naval choke points, the points of export and import of oil have become a major factor of world po power politics. You can't understand the war that's going on in the Yemen and the interest of outside powers in that without noting that the Yemen is a potential choke point and that China, the United States etc try and maintain bases in this area. In response to these pressures we see China putting huge investments into overland routes 
from China to the Middle East and to Europe to avoid the potential choke points that the American Navy could act on, American and Indian navies. And this is leading to a naval arms race on a scale that hasn't been seen since the 1930s. Um, this in 2012 was my listing of aircraft carriers that were under construction by powers that I knew of then. I think the Chinese orders have gone up to three now. India's building three aircraft carriers, Japan two, Korea two, the UK two, the US two. That kind of naval race hasn't been seen since the first half of the 20th century. Pictures of the new carriers being built by different countries. This is part of a desperate scramble by the various great powers, primarily capitalist powers, and or arguably China may be treated as a capitalist or a socialist power, but as the great powers are struggling to be able to control what are going to be critical sources of energy in the coming decades. Now, if we go back to the overall loops, we see that oil prices have an overall effect on the, the general level of uh, industrial activity in the, in the world economy. Now, the next thing is to look at the monetary profit-based economy of the capitalist world. And the key variables you have to look at this is the level of population, which is affected by the rate of death and the rate of birth, the, the level of industrialization, which in turn feeds through to the scale of the working class population. The greater the working class population, the, the greater the rate of profit tends to be because the more workers there are, the more it bids down wages. On the other hand, the greater the level of capital stock, the lower, lower the rate of profit is, because the more capital stock there is, those profits are divided over a larger stock. And as the uh, rate of profit falls, that reduces the, the rate of accumulation. So these are the key variables in this area, the f key feedback relationship. Now historically, at times, death rate has been a crucial factor. The end of the Middle Ages, or the High Middle Ages, was marked by the Black Death, which wiped out 60% of the population and that produced drastic rises in wages because a smaller population reduces the, the, the population available to work for wages and that reduces the, the level of profit that can be made. Now, Dave, Zachariah and I have published a number of papers showing that the mathematics of this are quite simple and I'm not going to go into the details of the maths at the moment but if you go and look at these and you go and look at the predictions they make uh, given by these equations here I'm, I'm not going to go over them at the moment what they show is that as the rate of accumulation rises profit rates go down as the rate of growth of the working population shrinks, profit rates go down. And the capitalist world at the moment is struck by a crisis of slowing birth rates, slowing population growth and constraint on profit rates. It got some relief for that during the 80s and 90s by being able to export capital to China where the ratio of capital stock to working population was low 
But that possibility is coming to an end now as the Chinese surplus population is absorbed. And these are graphs which show the relationship between the predicted rate of profit. For instance, in Japan here, the blue factor is the predicted rate of profit using these equations. And then you look at the actual rate of profit and you can see the actual rate of profit almost exactly mirrors it. The other ones are not shown so clearly in color, but every one of them for each country here, Britain, USA, Sweden, China, France, these laws all apply. Um, for the main capitalist countries, we see a rapid decline in the rate of profit until the 1980s, which was a period of rapid accumulation and declining growth of workforces. They respond to this by cutting back accumulation, cutting back the rate of accumulation and trying to import labor or to export capital to China. And the net effect of that in those countries where they did import labor, like France, um, the USA and Britain is to get some recovery of the, of the rate of profit. But in general, as the av available labor supplies choke off, the rate of profit starts to fall again because overall across the whole world, birth rates are falling. So here we see the figures for Japan. This is the predicted rate of profit according to Marxist theory. This is the actual rate of profit for following it a few years later. Again, France, predicted rate, actual rate. The predicted rate almost exactly tells you what the actual rate will be. China, there's some discrepancy in the figures I found around 2004. I'm not quite sure why. There's a sudden jump, perhaps a different method of, of um, accounting for the figures. But the interesting thing about this is China is showing the same tendency for the rate of profit to fall that Japan showed 30 years earlier. Typical post-war trend, declining, stabilizing in the 80s and 90s, a further decline afterwards. Sweden declining till the 80s, then neoliberal policies managed to pull it right back up again. Great Britain again decline until Thatcher comes in and destroys large quantities of capital stock so that the rate of profit amortized across the whole capital stock rises. The point is that capitalism is a disequilibrium system. As population reserves are absorbed, the rate of profit falls, labor becomes scarce and capital plentiful. And then the social balance of power between labor and capital shift towards labor. And it's a major task of Marxist political economy to come up with quantitative models of the rate at which this is happening on a world scale. Now, this then interacts with politics through what I'm calling the revolt system. This is the subsystem of my feedback relations related to, to revolt. So, if you have a low rate of accumulation, you get a high level of youth unemployment. And if you have a low level of food supply, high youth unemployment, you increase the probability of revolutions. It's also increased if um, you've got a high rate of uh, accumulation, if the rate of accumulation is high and it has an effect on education expenditure, 
education expenditure increases the level of the graduate population. If they're unemployed, that again creates a, a particular strata that are of discontent and increase the rate of revolutions. The general crises over energy supply increase the probability that major wars will occur. And major wars, we know historically, lead to revolutions. During periods of stability, the existing state superstructure and juridical forms of private property ensure the continued reproduction of capitalism. When this base is predominantly capitalist, the stability implies the absence of antagonistic contradictions blocking capital accumulation. Stability implies that social relations as a whole constantly reproduce the preconditions of a certain trajectory of economic development. But you then get restructuring conjunctures. A restructuring crisis has the following properties. Ah, oh, sorry, go back. A restructuring crisis affects the... Sorry, in, the, in a restructuring run the revolutionary crisis, the existing state still holds power. The minimum preconditions for this to occur are has an effective executive centre, the centre can command the various subordinate state apparatus, and these must include a hegemonic military force. When the executive remains in control of the military, then a transfer of, of state power involves the outright defeat of an existing state. Where conditions don't allow military defeat or internal disorganisation, then a, mil a revolutionary situation won't arise. And the crisis will at most lead to a restructuring under the ultimate hegemony of the existing ruling class. Uh, in these circumstances, parties representing Labour must work to produce the best possible compromise terms for their class, because there actually isn't a, a, a revolutionary conjuncture. The success or otherwise during a restructuring crisis will have a crucial effect on what happens afterwards. The contradictions that are resolved and their mode of resolution will determine what the train of struggle will be in the ensuing period and which contradictions will pre precipitate the next crisis. If it's a non-revolutionary crisis, the labour interest is that restructuring be as progressive as possible in the sense of establishing a terrain favourable to future struggles. You can't say in advance, without doing a concrete conjunctural analysis, the specific content of a progressive restructuring in different countries. But at the most general level, elements such as the centralisation of capital, the weakening of private property rights, and the growth of the working class can be, tended, can be identified as tending to give you a more advanced terrain. You can view the formation of a rebellious population as a phase change process. If you've got three axes of measurement in your system, the x-axis is the degree of satisfaction or non-privation. The y-axis is the degree of fear of repression. And the z-axis the degree of mutual communication among the population. Below the phase change frontier, the population is likely to condense from individuals to a coherent revolting block. The revolutionary population occurs in the corner where the fear of repression is lower and there is a high degree of, of uh, privation and when mutual communication is good. So this area here, if the 
fear of repression is low. That's the, the vertical axis. The degree of privation is high along that axis. And the degree of mutual communication is high. If you look at the fear axis and look at the revolutionary situations, the communards with the National Guard had no immediate fear of repression in 1870. Same goes for November 1918 in Germany because the population had disaffected soldiers with them. Again in Portugal in 1975 the population had disaffected soldiers with them. In Egypt during the um, Arab Spring in the first stage of that there was the hope that the army would stand aside and not fire on them. Um, if, if we take the Cultural Revolution in China, the Red Guards in China didn't fear the army at first as they believed Mao would hold the army back. It's been well established that the privation access is critical, that privation due to food shortages and unemployment have long been recognised as a key factor in producing uh, revolts. Communication access Reduced isolation due to better communication um, enables revolutionary sentiments to follow. Example was the use of big character posters in China, use of social media in the Arab revolutions. And if you go back, the use of the printing press at the time of the Protestant Reformation and the English Revolution. So, we then have to say, what is a, a, a revolutionary conjuncture? A revolutionary conjuncture is one where there's a real possibility of state power passing from the hands of an existing ruling class. And there are, it's worth distinguishing four types of revolutionary conjunctures. One where a peaceful transfer of power can be brought about by the latent presence of superior forces. Uh, on the revolutionary side, like in Mongolia in 1923, Czechoslovakia in 1948. Second example, where the transfer of power is due to the defection of decisive elements of the armed forces to the existing state, um, from the existing state to the side of revol revolt. March 1917 in Russia, November 1918 in Germany would be examples with the naval mutinies in, in Germany in 1918. Another case is where you get a peaceful transfer of power due to the collapse of the executive organs of the state and the consequent lack of communication in the military. The initial establishment of the Paris Commune was an example of that with the disintegration of Napoleon's imperial executive Another example is the collapse of the Soviet command structure after the failed coup against Gorbachev. And finally you get violent transfers of power by means of insurrection or civil war, like in the October Revolution or the Chinese Revolution. The importance of the military in revolt is so obvious that I scarcely need to emphasise it. Power can only be retained if the revolutionary forces are able to organise an army before the enemy re-establishes its executive. It's very dangerous for an opposition to advance revolutionary objectives in a period when military factors make such a transfer of power impossible. Repeated experience has shown that a well-disciplined and trained army under decisive centralised leadership can suppress any threat to state power other than a stu superior army. What's happened in the Arab world emphasises that. Who benefits from revolt? A crisis may raise the population to revolt, but the beneficiaries will be whichever opposition group has the most coherent and widely popularised ideology. Now this was a socialist in many countries up to 1975, it's arguable that it's been Islamists 
in the Middle East since 1975. It was neoliberals in Eastern Europe post-1989. For a while it became socialists in Latin America post-2000. It's arguable that in North America it's again becoming socialist. This is true whether the crisis is a restructuring one or a revolutionary one. In the end you need a popularised view of political economy and the type of state you want and that's going to be decisive. Let's look at the political economy questions. In a crisis, the existing regime has a key initial advantage in that it's got an established decision making and policy formation apparatus. And it has an educational system that propagates these ideas. Successful oppositions have to have a well developed set of alternative policies which have coherence and can inspire both political leadership and their followers. It's critically important that oppositional political economists develop clear strategic policy options that are widely and internationally shared. It's been one of the big failings of Western Marxists that they ignore policy. Without this alternative consensus being widely disseminated, it'll be, it won't be difficult for the existing social order to ride out any popular discontent which arises. This involves us developing policies on environmental regulation and planning, forms of economic organisation and property, the type of political system we want to see, and the forms of international law and international organisation that is desirable. 